Welcome to the 2018 Rural Assembly. We're just so happy to have all of you with us today from all across uh, the state. This is our favorite time of the year. A few days after the 2017 Rural Assembly was in the books, uh, this, this staff really began working and planning in earnest for this year's event. Over the past 12 months, we've worked diligently to create the best possible rural convening for you focused on the issues most pressing to the future of rural North Carolina and to the more than four million people who call it home. Each year we think of this event as our rural homecoming for our leaders and partners. Standing here looking across the room, I see what makes our state so special and what makes our rural places worth fighting for. The staff, board, and I are grateful to be working with you here today and every day throughout the year. You also hold us accountable to do the work that must be done across this state, from east to west, mountains to coast, and at each and every crossroads in between. We get our energy and our inspiration from you, and we thank you for that. Each of you received a Rural Assembly event booklet when you checked in at registration. This booklet is your resource guide for these next two days. It is our go-to resource for everything from breakout descriptions to the hotel Wi-Fi password. If you can't find what you need in that booklet, please don't hesitate to stop by, to stop a Rural Center staff member. Just look for the yellow badge or stop by the registration desk. If they can't help you, they'll find someone who can. Before we begin our program today, I would like to take a moment to thank our generous sponsors for their support of the 2018 Rural Assembly. This event would not be possible without their partnership, so let me begin by rec recognizing each of them. Would you please standing if you are a representative of one of our sponsoring organizations? North Carolina Electric Cooperatives, the Duke Endowment, Wells Fargo, Carolina Farm Credit, North Carolina State Cooperative Extension, First National Bank, United Healthcare, BB&T, North Carolina Farm Bureau, Blue Cross Blue Shield of North Carolina, the North Carolina Community College Foundation, Carolina Complete Health, Dominion Energy, First Citizens Bank, Thread Capital, United Community Bank, Brooks Pierce, and Mount Olive Pickles. Please join me in showing our deepest appreciation for their support. Over the next two days, you will hear examples of places across our state and nation where a leader or a group of leaders are thinking ambitiously and creatively about how to harness the latent potential of their neighbors and their community assets to reimagine a future for the places they call home. Certainly, certainty can be a tricky concept. There are a few things in life we can proclaim with absolute certainty without a quick note of qualification or a lingering sense of doubt. We at the Rural Center feel confident we can stand behind one certainty. Change, innovation, progress, and growth cannot happen in a community, a small town, or even a bustling metro without a visionary leader or a group of leaders. The 2018 Rural Assembly, revving the rural engine, local leaders driving innovation, is focused on how communities can engage the next generation of rural leaders and create a space to nurture a more innovative approach to problem solving and community development. Our work this year is a continuation of last year's Rural Assembly. We know that for rural North Carolina to grow and to thrive, our rural communities must boldly claim their future. Last year, we heard the inspiring words of Vivian Howard. Let's do something excellent because we are capable. Do not let your location determine the quality and reach of your work. We are proud of the places we call home, but we are also realistic. We see daily the str struggles our communities face. We know the hurdles and we know the roadblocks. But we also know the potential, the determination of the people we call our neighbors and the promise in an emerging generation of new leaders. We know our communities are capable of meeting their challenges and seizing their opportunities. It's easy to get lost in the pessimistic narrative 
surrounding our rural communities across the nation and in this state. But what you will hear over these next two days is an alternative narrative, and it belongs to us. From the American heartland to the mountains of Appalachia to the Mississippi Delta, we will hear stories about capable communities who drew up their own roadmap and set out on a collective journey to change their future. What you will hear in the words of James and Deborah Fallows later this evening is their experiences visiting communities across the country that did not let their location determine the quality of their work or the future they wanted to achieve. What they saw in their travels is what we saw in our own visiting of each of North Carolina's 80 rural counties on our rural road trip. Successful small towns and rural communities that identified their own unique assets, empowered their local leaders, and embraced innovation. So let us prepare to do something excellent because we are today capable. Let's make sure the narrative that guides us and that drives our work is one that we have written and that w one that we recognize. And now let us begin. It's my pleasure to introduce a partner and a friend of the Rural Center and a faithful advocate for rural North Carolina. Most everyone in this room knows him as well as I do. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the president of the Golden Leaf Foundation, Dan Gerlach. Good afternoon. Ten, ten years ago, about this time, I stood before you as, as then the incoming president of the Golden Leaf Foundation. I still rank among the top two Golden Leaf Foundation presidents ever to my <laughs> predecessor, Valeria Lee. And I'm honored to be here today and think about all the work that the Golden Leaf and the Rural Center have been together. But one of the best things about the Rural Center is its ability to reach outside, to learn new things, to continually figure out ways how to make our people's lives better. And so our keynote speaker, who I, who I have the high honor of introducing, will do exactly that. Bill Bynum is a native son of North Carolina. He worked with two great North Carolina institutions, the Self-Help Credit Union and the North Carolina Rural Center, before in 1994 leaving to go run the Enterprise Corporation of the Delta. Now he is the CEO of a group called HOPE, and HOPE has a, its own community a credit union. It has the Enterprise Center, for which it started, and also has a policy institute. Because I think Bill will tell you, and I've had the honor now of hearing him twice, a couple years ago when he came to North Carolina to share his story, and just a few minutes ago when he talked about their role in meeting an unexpected challenge of recovery in the Delta for Katrina and Rita a few years ago, something that we have much, perhaps, to learn from. Over his time since 1994, the value of, of the organizations that he has helped build have resulted in the investment of over two and a half billion dollars in helping over one million people in one of the poorest areas of our nation. I know you will look forward to hearing his words as much as I do. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the stage at North Carolina Income Home, Bill Bynum. Thank you. that because, um, you know, when I was invited to come to speak, I was excited. I always grab every opportunity I can to come home and visit friends and family. And so I was excited about it. Then I started thinking about the fact that the truth is probably most of what I'm going to talk about today, I learned from the people and organizations in this room. And so when I'm talking around the country or when I'm talking in the Deep South, they don't know me as well as you all know me, so um, that made me a little bit nervous. But um, nonetheless, I am truly honored and, and proud to be back home um, with so many friends. Um, I want to thank Patrick um, for inviting me and Dan for all that you do um, and just congratulate you. You guys fill some very big shoes. Valeria Lee is a giant, is one of my heroes. And, and so is um, Billy Ray Hall. So, um, yeah, um, and y'all have picked it up admirably. So congratulations and thank you for all that you do. Um, it is good to be home. Um, I, um, as I was preparing for my remarks um, over the past 
um, several weeks. Um, my younger sister, as you know, siblings will often do, they'll, 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 they'll bring you back to earth. And um, she told me, well, she reminded me that I was about to turn 60, which I did last week, uh, you know? <laughs> and, you know, and, and, and it, it kind of slipped up on me. You know how we are. We bit, we're busy. We just blow by some of those important things. And I uh, had a birthday coming up, which was pretty cool. But it, um, it had me looking over my shoulder a little bit and reflecting uh, on coming to grips with the fact that, you know, if I'm going to count for anything, I better get busy. Um, and uh, appreciating how much we as individuals are really the product of countless people and experiences that we've had over the years. Um, while I absolutely claim and I'm proud of native son status of North Carolina, the truth is I was born in, in New York City. Um, my parents, like so many people of color in the South, across the country, um, felt that they needed to move outside of the South to have a fair shot at opportunity. And so my parents moved to New York where they uh, had me and my sister Betty, who's here, um, um, and my sister Nicole. And uh, we moved, but we moved back uh, to North Carolina uh, when we were, I was in the first grade. So I grew up here. We moved back because you know, there were challenges. It, it, you know, it, was, it wasn't as, the grass wasn't as green in New York City. As, um, as we thought it would be. Uh, there were challenges to raising a family. So we moved back here. Um, um, I was in New York, by the way, last week. I was in a friend's apartment. Um, uh, I guess it's an apartment. Uh, it's a, so friends who's a go former chair, vice chair of Goldman Sachs. It's a $30 million apartment <laughs> in the Pierre Hotel, looking over out over Central Park. Beautiful, leaves changing. We don't get the leaves changing as much in Mississippi as we do here in North Carolina and on the East Coast. So it was beautiful looking out. And I could see about 40 blocks up between 2nd and 3rd Avenue, um, 311 East 109th Street, the little apartment, little crackerjack <laughs> apartment that we used to live in. I remember my cousin Butchie pulled down the, had those tanks above the, uh, those, uh, on the toilet. You pulled the chain. I remember he pulled the chain and the whole thing came down with roaches and all, all over his head. <laughs> um, so, but it, it just struck me. Um, I was sitting in this incredible apartment you know, with an amazing view that looking out at that little apartment and how much responsibility I have and we have to close the gaps between people in that little bit of apartment and the people who can afford to live in a $30 million apartment. It was part time. She has a place in, in, in um, LA and one in Santa Monica as well. But you know, just just struck me how big the divides are between people in this country, and how we, as advocates for rural America and for America in general, uh, have the responsibility to work to close those gaps. Um, so as I said, we moved to North Carolina. My family came back when I was in the first grade. We moved into Bynum. How many of y'all know Bynum, North Carolina? Uh, and it was named after the people who owned my ancestors. You know, and we moved into my great grandmother's house, eventually moved into a single wide trailer on the lot next door. And every weekend, um, I think it was Thursday night, uh, down at the barbecue joint, um, the Klan would have a rally. And, um, you know, they were not, they were a little relatively toothless then, but still, it's, it got your attention as a black kid, a uh, little, little first grader. And I remember me and my dad sat on the sat on the well. I had my BB gun and he had his rifle when people come by and throw rocks through the windows um, at our, in our trailer. And, um, you know, but, you know, kids fortunately don't carry the baggage that their parents uh, carry as much. And so I got to, went to the, uh, first I went to all black school, Horton High, Horton Elementary. Um, education there wasn't as strong as I had had in New York, even as a first grader. So, Parents said, you know, knew how important education was, so I went to Pittsburgh Primary, the majority white school. Had a signed seat on the bus every now and then would get spitballs thrown in the back of my head. But, and then a few years later, the school's integrated. So I knew kids on both sides. And fortunately, said kids don't carry the stuff that their parents uh, carry as much. So I had friends. Uh, eventually, they was captain of the football team, elected me senior class president. 
got out of there, went to North Carolina, University of North Carolina, and um, before I knew it, I was elected chairman of the Black Student Movement at the UNC at the time when um, um, as there was Julius Chambers, who was the head of the, um, who had been at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. Um, there was a lawsuit between UNC and the federal government. Jimmy Carter was in office, and the first air fly, airplane flight that I ever took was as chair of the Black Student Movement flying to D.C to testify before the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare about the disparities between black students, black, um, black faculty retention and recruitment, and there were significant disparities. Um, I remember my first day as chair of the BSM, um, we marched on South Building, the administrative building at, at UNC, and um, for every Taylor was chancellor. I remember Chancellor Taylor saying, you don't have any recourse. We were marching because Sonia Sohn was the, uh, a revered professor of African American studies, had been denied tenure despite publishing t high teaching marks, all the things you're supposed to do to get tenure, but she'd been denied tenure. And so we marched on South Building. And, um, you know, I, I, they called the police to get us out of South Building. I found myself on TV as. had never been on a plane before, but it was, um, it was an overwhelming experience for a young um, person. Well, fast forward, uh, today, if you go on UNC's campus, uh, not only did we get the, uh, it's the only, uh, only time I know of that a tenure decision has been reversed um, by the university, but today the Sonia um, Haynes Stone Center sits prominently on campus as a testament to the important work that Dr. Stone uh, contributed to the university and to the people of North Carolina. So I got an incredible amount of experience and, um, f and, and, and just, just learned a ton from being here. And so I was, but you can imagine how shocked I was when in 2013, after thinking that they were gonna run me off of campus in Chapel Hill, they presented me with the Distinguished Alumnus Award. Um, and so it's, um, <clears throat> You just never know where your road's gonna take you. Um, I ended up at the Rural Center after I left self-help. And uh, we started the micro, I came here to start the micro enterprise uh, program. Uh, we managed the program that provided funding to community development corporations and community development credit unions. Uh, we started the capital access program. I remember we, um, Mike Espy was the Secretary of Agriculture. We went to DC and asked Secretary um, Espy to help us to expand the rural initiative. We got, um, we ended up um, getting significant support from the Department of, Agri uh, of Agriculture, created business development programs, tech uh, transfer programs, programs to help close the gaps in rural North Carolina. Well, I went to, left here and moved to Mississippi in um, 1994. And I was walking down the street in Jackson and I saw somebody I thought I recognized, and it was Mike Espy. I said, Sec Secretary Espy, you probably don't remember me. And I told him about the work we'd done at the Rural Center. And I said, well, when you get a chance, I'd love to um, visit with you, tell you a little bit what I'm trying to do here at Enterprise Corporation Delta. Well, that evening, Secretary Espy and I were sitting in my house having dinner. Today, Mike Espy is the chairman of the board of the Hope Enterprise Corporation, and he's running for the United States Senate. Um, from Mississippi. And so again, it's just amazing how these dots connect us all. Another example of a dot connecting, one of my first jobs here at the Rural Center um, was participating in this event. I think we called the Rural Summit then, um, Billy Ray. But the, um, uh, the guest speaker was Governor William Winter, Governor of Mississippi. And you know, we all have our isms. I, I really wasn't very interested in hearing what an old white guy, governor of Mississippi, had to say. We were North Carolina. We were one of the most progressive places. We were leading the country in rural development. We had education, strong education, strong community development organizations. Well, I listened to William Winter speak. And he talked about the work he had done to make sure that every child in Mississippi had access to kindergarten, uh, regardless of where they grew up, where the, who their parents were, what their skin color was. And I just said, Bill, shame on you. You know, bringing those isms. To, and, and just, you know, so it just reminded me how important it is to not look at somebody 
uh, because of the skin color, because of their age, because of where they're from. But listen to them. It's, a, it's amazing how those realities uh, often differ from the perceptions that we go into those conversations with. And we're certainly Fast forward, um, that was in 89, I believe, when I came to the Rural Center. Well, William Winter, um, five years later, is when I was being recruited uh, to come to Mississippi to start the Enterprise Corporation, the decision was made a lot easier because William Winter was on the board of the um, Foundation for the Mid-South that was recruiting me and eventually was my board member. So just so many valuable lessons, so many uh, connections that uh, I've built on uh, from the work that I've done here and, um, and I'm still learning. Um, so uh, I want to thank you all for helping to make me uh, um, who I am and any successes that I've been able to achieve is only because of the combined relationships, the connections of people who have supported and educated me along the way. I want to take a few minutes to just show you a uh, brief video of um, of the work that we do in 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 the deep south. Um, my, the communities, as you all know, we were talking about this morning after Katrina. Residents tell their story. People tell a story a heck of a lot better than I do. So just I'm gonna share this. Years ago, Sean had a lot of stores. There were stores all on each side of the streets. We had a theater back here. We had grocery stores on that end of the street, five and dime stores, all kind of clothing stores all the way around here. Man, you wouldn't believe how big this place used to be. We don't have anything now. And uh, they tell me to keep the bottle shop open all the time so the town won't look like it's closed down. Here we are, we're working. At the time, we were working women. We didn't have the collateral. All we had was our knowledge and our want to do. That's what we had. I was recently released from prison after doing 20 years in prison. You know, so many times after being incarcerated, you get to feel like you don't matter. My daughter was ill. And I had walked in and I really needed some money to get my grandkids. I went and talked to the, the loan representative. And I told her, I said, well, my daughter's very, very ill. And um, I need to get my grandkids from Mississippi. Hope Credit Union saved us. We were glad to see Hope Credit Union come to show. Because we didn't have anywhere that we could cash a check or have an account or get change or, or anything. It really helped the town better than anything we have had here in the last 10 or 15 years. Hope have really embraced these people, and that's why I'm a member of Hope. I think opportunity is having the chance to be able to show that what you dream to do can come true. We greatly appreciate what Hope did, because we really wouldn't have had this whole thing. If, um, if they hadn't taken the chance. You know, Hope come by and they help with teaching us how to open an account and teach us about the savings and checking accounts, which is a big deal because most guys like myself have they've been incarcerated. We never had bank accounts or, or any fashion. See, I know the tellers by name, they know me by name. And so it makes me feel like that I'm important, that I matter. And then she said, well, you want to go get those kids? I said, I sure do. She said, well, guess what? We're going to get those tickets. I said, OK. I started crying. Whew. And um, they brought my, my grandkids here. With hope, I think they're, they're there. It's, it is like the last hope. This is your hope. They give that chance to people. Going to Hope for me was just making me feel like I belong, making me feel like they know me. Not what I've done or where I've been, but the glen that they see today. My family are not my immediate family. My family are the people that's in my life, and they're bringing me towards my opportunities. And Hope is my family. 
Yes. Black preacher told me, say, there's hope for the hopeless. <laughs> so I like that name, Hope. So I left, left uh, the World Center 25 years ago, uh, went to Jackson, Mississippi, and um, op we started Enterprise Corporation Delta. And for the past 25 years, I've been listening, um, like I listened to William Winter. I listened to folks like the people on that video. And they told me what, um, you know, what, what I think we sometimes uh, don't listen, uh, or don't, don't hear enough. They have the solutions, real people know what they need, but what often we lack, they lack, are the tools. So we started as a one and a half million dollar loan fund um, uh, back in 1994 uh, with a audacious mission of transforming the economy of the Delta. Uh, <laughs> you know, we, we're still working on that. Um, but um, we, we, we've been busy over the years. Um, we, um, you know, again, we're the product of what we know. I had been fortunate to be one of the, I was the second employee at Self Help. We, when we, we, I was one of the charter members of the, charter board members of the Self Help Credit Union. And I, so, and I work with minority credit unions here at the Rural Center. So I'm not trying to reinvent the wheel. I'm trying to bring the wheel and make it available to people who don't have a wheel. And so in, in the Delta, um, we bought some of the tools I learned here. Um, and when I joined the church, my pastor said, well, Tell me about your background. I mentioned credit unions, and he said, we've been trying to start a credit union here for years, and that's going to be your ministry. You're going to start a credit union. And I said, okay, pastor. And so my day job was doing the business development in the Delta, and on a volunteer basis, we started what it turned out to be the first credit union chartered in Mississippi in eight years, and it was first credit, only credit union to be chartered for about another 25 years. Didn't realize how, how valuable that piece of paper was. But eventually, the, the, Hope, the Hope Credit Union um, needed more uh, infrastructure, uh, more capacity than it could support, than it, than it could bring to bear as a volunteer church-based organization. At the same time, the Enterprise Corporation Delta, we found that businesses um, could thrive if they had the tools. But, but while foundations had been very generous in supporting our work early on, um, we, there just wasn't enough foundation support. $41 per person philanthropic dollars in the Delta compared to 451 philanthropic dollars per person in U.S., $2,000 per person in New York City. So we're kind of getting what we pay for in the Delta, $41 versus $2,000 per person. So there wasn't a lot of philanthropic support. We were fortunate to get some to get us started. Not a whole lot of banks, um, not a nation, well, it's not Nations Bank anymore or NCMB. Bank of America. Um, it wasn't, there's not a Bank of America that, that looks at the Delta as their primary community reinvestment assessment area. And so we had to figure out another way to do it. And so I took what I learned here. We started a credit union and that credit union became a part of the Enterprise Corporation. We did, we need, it provided Enterprise Corporation with liquidity to expand our lending. Um, and we gave the credit union um, professional staffing who to help support its growth. And so we were off to the races. Um, bring the slides back up, if you will. So we, um, over the years, we became, as we expanded beyond the Mississippi Delta, um, we are now statewide in Mississippi, Arkansas, Louisiana, Tennessee, and we recently opened three offices in Alabama. Combined, these states are among, uh, we have one third of the counties in the United States that have had at least 20% poverty for three decades in a row. Racial challenges are pervasive. When I drive from my offices in Little Rock, where the Little Rock Nine um, helped break down walls in Central High uh, in the 50s, um, and to Memphis, where Dr. King was assassinated, uh, advocating for economic rights, moving from voting rights to economic rights so that people could support their families. Driving through the Mississippi Delta where Emmett Till was assassinated because he dared to say something to a white woman. 
Jackson, Mississippi, um, Merle and Meg Evers, Mer Merle Evers and Rena Evers, uh, the uh, wife and daughter of the slain civil rights leader Meg Evers, are members of Hope Credit Union now. They're they're um, uh, were, and years after their husband was assassinated, uh, again advocating for social justice in Jackson, Mississippi. I drive down across the Edmund Bettis Bridge. Um, I've driven over it a few times, but when I drive over across it now from Selma to Montgomery, I can hear the ghost of the history of this region talking to us uh, and saying, and I drive through Selma and it's still the poorest town in the state of Alabama. Um, a lot has been done, a lot of progress, but we've still got work to do. Um, not just in the Deep South, not just in Mississippi and the states I work in, but, but here as well, across the country. Uh, those divides have gotten wider and it's up to us to do something about it. These gaps play out in so many ways. Um, as, as, as you know, we are a community development financial institution. That's our primary tool. But regardless of what your priority is, whether it's education, um, health, jobs, you name it, um, provided people with a mortgage. A mortgage is a house, a home, is still the primary asset that most Americans own. It allows them to get equity that they can use to start a small business or pay for emergencies or send their kids to college. Um, um, those are disproportionately present in persistent poverty areas. The red outlined counties are the persistent poverty counties that were shown on the previous map. The green counties are places where the health education outcomes are the lowest in the region or the health rankings are the lowest or unemployment is the highest where you have the highest incidence of subprime and high cost mortgage lending. And then you go to banks, um, to banking. Um, people, 40% um, uh, of Hope members didn't have a banking account before they joined the credit union. Another 20 plus percent uh, relied on petty lenders and check cashes. So 62, 63% of people are on the edge of the banking system and don't have basic tools. And so if you're gonna pay for uh, a new healthcare center or a school facility or help a business start up like Thread Capital is doing, you're not gonna do it if you don't have financial tools. They're critical to closing these opportunity gaps. And again, disproportionately these gaps play out among the most vulnerable. When you look at women, when you look at rural people, when you look at low-income people, and then you look at people of color, you see the, this where these gaps are the widest. I spent two years, the last two years, as the only Southerner on a commission that the Gates Foundation funded. It was the first look at poverty in the United States, the U.S. Partnership on Mobility from Poverty. And if you look at this, these maps, I'm sure many of you have seen it. Economist Raj Chetty was a part of this commission as well. And the red areas are where the gaps, um, the mobility ladder is the high, hardest for um, Americans. It's, it indicates that the percentage of uh, people um, where the children um, are not, uh, the income of children with parents earning less than $25,000 a year. Well. The data shows that uh, 40 years ago, uh, back in the, well, I guess more than 40, in the 40s, in the 50s, it was almost a certainty, 90% chance that the children were gonna make more than their parents. Well, today it's 50-50, it's a coin flip. And you wonder why people are, 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 are at each other's, uh, uh, are feeling such pressure, uh, feeling so divided. They, they feel like if somebody else uh, gets an opportunity, they take an opportunity away from their kids. That's where a lot of this division is coming from. And so we, we have to close these gaps. If you look at the relationship between persistent poverty and economic mobility and financial services, you look at where the highest mobility counties are uh, and where the persistent counties are. Because the poverty counties are none in the highest mobility counties. Um, there's a certainly a racial disparity in, 90, in the highest mobility um, counties, 96% white, uh, as opposed to 33% in the low mobility counties. Uh, where the bank branches are, you see those um, uh, disproportionately uh, absent in low mobility places. Uh, mortgage originators, not as present. Access to small business capital, $86,000 um, average loan per thousand residents versus 35,000 
in low mobility counties. And again, these are rural places. These are places where people of color live. And they're not just, again, in Mississippi. You're here, you've seen them here across rural Mississippi. They're in Appalachia. They're in Indian country. Uh, they're in the Central Valley. Um, they're across the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, talked about our, our work, um, banking the underbank. You can see here that um, almost um, the large percent, percentage of our members uh, are, uh, were previously unbanked. As I said, 61% uh, here um, were either unbanked or underbanked. They uh, almost half earn less than $36,000 uh, per year. And 72%, um, actually 80% of our members are, are people of color. Uh, so we are working hard to close the gaps uh, between those who are most vulnerable and lack access to financial services. Uh, we made some progress. Last year was the first year we've exceeded $100 million in our direct lending. We're excited about that. Um, that's consumer loans to over almost 3,000 um, small dollar loans. Loans, you know, if you, you know, if you're in a rural area and you can't get a car loan uh, or a truck loan, you might as well be unemployed. Um, and so you, you shouldn't have to go to a high cost auto lender. I served as chairman of the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau Advisory Board um, for several years and high cost auto lending, um, predatory lending, um, student debt uh, are, are just out of control. And again, disproportionately among rural folks and, and people of color. And so really excited about the progress we made in, in doing what we've been doing, but it's not enough. We certainly know that we can't do it by ourselves. And while we are no longer that million and a half dollar loan fund, today we're combined about $400 million plus in assets. But you know, that, that'd be nice for a small community bank, but we're a little, little ambitious. We're in five states. Uh, so th that $400 million doesn't go very far. And so what we try to do is um, take the data from our members, Tell, take their stories, and then go to Congress, go to local officials, go to banks, and make the case that if you make these investments, you can close the gaps. And it's, if you look at the, and I think more and more probably business people are getting this more than anyone else, uh, certainly more than elected officials often acknowledge, but the changes, the demographics in the country are shifting. Um, we're, it's, it's, it's becoming a much more brown and black country. And I think that makes people nervous, um, but I don't think that it should because if we, it's inevitable, it is happening, the data are clear, and if we care about who's going to take care of us, of our children, who's going to provide health care, who's going to grow the crops, who's going to be our productive workforce, uh, if we don't equip everyone to participate, then we're shooting ourselves in the foot. So we take the data from the investments that we make and, sh and take that to policymakers and then try to get them to, to do something about it, to banks to try to do something about it. And so uh, we talked about um, how, uh, I think Dan mentioned that we've generated over two and a half billion dollars in financing over our 25 years history. Uh, a significant part of that has been through influencing policy. A few years ago, we partnered with several uh, groups, again, in Indian country, um, uh, Appalachia, Central Valley, um, and we identified a half a billion dollars that has gone unspent in USDA's budget for community facilities. And they made it, we were able to get them to make it available to the community development financial institutions. And we've used that to direct into community facilities, schools, nonprofit facilities, healthcare facilities, in persistent poverty areas, you know it, it's, it's 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 not, you know it, you know every it, half a billion dollars doesn't come into the pockets of community development financial institutions every day, and we found out that collectively we can make that case a lot more effectively. Um, I think that's that is so so important, and I think that's why another reason I was so pleased to come back here today. Um, the conversation this morning about. Uh, hurricane recovery. Looking at this, at the diversity in this room, I mean, you all have been addressing these issues for a long uh, time, and I think we all recognize that we cannot do it by ourselves. No single sector can do this important work by ourselves. And so, coming together across 
communities, regardless of what they look, know the realities. There are a lot more votes. There's a lot higher population in urban areas. And I remember what a gentleman named Gary Grant uh, once told me. Gary lived in Tillery, uh, North Carolina. When I was working at Self Help, we drove up there. He, he operated a casket manufacturer, and we were going to help him convert that to employee ownership. And uh, Gary, uh, when I left to go to Mississippi, he gave me a little card. Uh, he said, uh, be careful or we'll include you in our plans. Um, <laughs> and you know, the, what he was saying is, you know, we cannot ignore, urban areas can't ignore rural places. And similarly, rural places can't ignore our urban neighbors. We've got to find that common ground. And I think that is there. I mean, all of us have, you know, cousins that live in family that live in one place or another. And so while we're being advocates, we just can't ignore the impact of what our decisions make on, on, on folks who live elsewhere. Um, I mentioned the, um, the work that we did with the um, Gates um, Foundation. Um, we, uh, we co-authored a paper, it was about a dozen recommendations that were put to the Gates Foundation for what they would do to, um, as a part of their first serious effort to address poverty in the United States. They've done a lot uh, internationally. They even have a financial services for the poor initiative internationally, but not in the United States. And so we said, here are some things that we want you to consider. And so we wrote a paper, uh, Opening Mobility Pathways by Closing the Financial Services Gaps. And we came up with four recommendations. One is to triple the level of bank investment in low-income, high-poverty communities in underserved places. Um, you know, banks are more profitable than they've been at any time in our history. At the same time, bank branches have closed it's in record numbers in low-income census tracts since the financial crisis. You know, at the same time, organizations like ours, well, we've gone from seven to 30 branches since the financial crisis because people didn't all of a sudden stop needing financing for a car or for a mortgage, and they certainly didn't deserve to be subjected to a petty lender or a check casher. And so we've tried to go in and fill those gaps. And some of the banks, Regions Bank, for example, has donated, I think, nine facilities to us um, over the past several years, and we've opened those branches, and we've outperformed regions because we are serious about serving people in these communities. I remember in Itabina, Mississippi, um, and it is what it sounds like, it's an itty-bitty, uh, Itabina, Mississippi, a small town in the Mississippi Delta. Um, some of you may have heard me uh, this story, but one of our first members there was a woman, who, a woman, uh, African-American woman, who on her 100th birthday, used the money that she got um, as a gift and opened her first ever banking account, you know, because it was the first time she felt respected and welcome in a financial institution. Well, it shouldn't take a hundred years for anyone to feel like they can take advantage of something that we all, so many of us take for granted. Uh, banks are fairly insured. They wouldn't exist, but for our taxpayer dollars, they have an obligation to serve everyone. And so it was, um, you know, Serving people like Miss um, um, Fanny Dotson is 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 is, a, is is something that we should make sure we all um, take seriously. And so, um, expanding bank lending in high poverty, um, underserved areas. And we know the banks aren't going to do it all, but banks are still the primary source of financing in this country. Um, it was mentioned earlier that the Community Reinvestment Act is up for consideration. That is an existential issue for community development. No, nothing else finances community development more and, and than, than bank investment. And so um, we need to take that seriously and weigh on, on CRA changes. We know the banks aren't gonna do it all, so the second recommendation is to significantly increase the capacity of community development financial institutions like Thread Capital, like Self Help, like, so, like Hope, like the Support Center, like the uh, Community Development Initiative. You all have a great network of CDFIs in North Carolina. Um, really need to make those investments. Third, third recommendation was to, make, uh, to create universal banking access, a universal banking account, so that everyone has access to a basic low-cost checking account so that they don't have to go to pay, pay the lenders and pawn shops and check cashers, and so that when they start to um, get a decent job and are ready to buy a house, they can do it in an affordable and responsible way. 
And the last recommendation was consumer protections. There's so many financial predators. There's something I mentioned this morning uh, that you, we should need to be on the lookout for in the aftermath of the hurricanes here in North Carolina. Um, there's going to be a lot of money in these communities, and there will be a lot of people looking to take advantage of vulnerable people who don't have as much wherewithal as the people in this room does. And so we need consumer protection so that when we make these investments and people climb the economic ladder, then they have, um, then, then, then they're investments are protected. And so um, we presented these uh, recommendations. We had a group room full of foundations, um, public officials, groups very much like the ones in this room. And we have a series of planning groups um, that are working to develop action steps, strategy guides for how to implement these recommendations, and we'll present them to a new Congress in the coming year and take them around to foundations and anyone else who is serious about closing these economic divides that exist in the country. And so policy is, is, a, is a force multiplier for organizations like ours. We couldn't do it all by ourselves. And so, uh, again, the, the, the coming together uh, that is represented in this room is, is a critical um, piece of the puzzle. I'll close by just uh, returning a little bit to what I talked about earlier. Um, you know, it's it's really um, striking to me how 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 much the people I've met have changed the way I look at the world. Um, whether it's people uh, that I work with every day, the people that I've worked with here in uh, North Carolina, uh, the people who we serve at Hope Credit Union, and um, someone recently mentioned said to me that we are. We're fighting for the soul of our country, you know. I think there may be some truth to that. I, you know, it was 50 years ago when the civil rights um, um, fight in this country was at its peak, but it surely doesn't feel like 50 years ago when you listen to the news and when you uh, think about the synagogue, when you think about what happened in Kentucky and what happened in Charleston and what happened in Baton Rouge and in Dallas and in Minnesota and over and over and over. And so. We, we are better than that. So I think we are fighting for the soul of our country. And I think the solution is to look to local people. They know what the solutions are. Uh, the, the solutions aren't in Washington. Maybe the money is, but the solutions are not. Uh, the solutions are local. Local people have the solution. They need the tools, though. They need advocates. They need you. Um, um, Martin Eakes is like a brother to me and a friend, and Martin spoke at this meeting in Birmingham, and he says that if we're not advocates, if we're not advocating for the right thing, uh, then we're not doing our job. I'll take it even further. If we're not advocating, then we're complicit. We are part of the problem. Uh, we have to be a part of the solution for these things that we're seeing in our country, and because people need us, our country needs us, and if we're gonna be successful, uh, advocates for, for rural people. If we're going to make this a more fair society, then we need to be sure that all rural people see themselves in our stories, regardless of what they look like. We had to step back, stop listening to ourselves, uh, stop listening to our echo chambers, whether it's CNN or Fox News or your friends and buddies. We've got to broaden our conversations and only often reinforce what we think and what we've always thought. We have to listen. We have to listen to that governor who I met here uh, almost 30 years ago, uh, who might turn out to be a great mentor, a dear friend, and one of the most important people in your life. Thank you so much.